Oh, there. Caught him. My, oh, my. He was dancing while he was still going down. And, and now a right hand reigns in from Jackson as he's on the attack. And he comes back and wins it. What a turnaround by Greg Jackson. Behaves like a... Well, right now that day. Okay, to start this list off, what does yeet or get yeeted mean? It's pretty much to excel or get trampled by what life is throwing at you. So pretty much this translates to best boxing comeback video. Because there's too many damn comeback videos on this platform, that's why. And with that, let's start the list. Jermaine Taylor was making his fifth title defense of his middleweight crown against underdog Kelly Pavlik. Taylor, whom didn't look all that well against Kasim Uma after the first half, and most notably, Corey Spinks, who literally was just shy of becoming the middleweight champion. Taylor had a lot to prove and a lot of anger and frustration to let out. And Kelly Pavlik was that man. And my gosh, Taylor started the fight quick and the fight looked about done. Pavlik's team knew this would happen, prepared especially for this moment, and thanks to, at the time, alternative strength and conditioning training. What we saw in Kelly when he first came down here was an incredible work ethic. It's phenomenal how he can change his body and get in phenomenal shape very, very quickly. Pavlik has been incorporating these workouts into training since his first fight against Jermaine Taylor in September 2007. He says him getting up in the second round that had a lot to do with his tire training and stuff that he had the strength and power to get back up and keep fighting. Pavlik was able to shake it off fast and mount up a comeback, in which, when it rained, it poured down, stopping Taylor in the seventh round. Leonard was down on the cards by a lot against Hurts. He would need a knockout to win. You got nine minutes. You're blowing it now, son. You're blowing it. I separate the man from the boys now. We're blowing it. In other words, you lose. You got to take it away from him, okay? Speed! And you just see him explode out of the corner. This, of course, is the 13th round, Randy. You heard everything that Angelo Dundee had to say. You got nine minutes. You got nine minutes. Ray just gave it all. I mean, everything. I mean, see, Tommy dig down, but Ray stooped down and dig down to get this fight out. After some motivational words in the corner, Leonard got at it, stopping Hearns in the 14th round. Hearns has got to give him some respect. Oh, grab hold of him, which he's not doing. No, he's too weak. He has nothing left. He's going to be knocked out. And the referee is dumping the fight. The referee is dumping the fight. I don't believe this. I don't believe that either. Oh, no. This fight was Tony's biggest test against undefeated Michael Nunn for his IBF middleweight title. Tony came into the fight as a 20 to 1 underdog, and from the opening bell, it showed that he was. Grossly down on the scorecards, Tony needed a knockout, but it really didn't look like he was going to pull it off. But when you're fighting someone who has dynamite as hands, and lights out as your nickname, you better be on point the whole night, in which none was till late in the 11th round. None completely loses concentration, and Tony clocks him with a perfect shot. It makes you think, what was he doing? They, they better get their corner Michael off, Nunn. I'll tell you. This corner is up. James not Tony, kidding, he's not going to make it up. And I don't think he's trying to get up. This crowd trying to get him back. He was able to get up, but none was so far gone that his trainer was forced to stop the fight to protect him, because certainly the ref was not going to. In the early days of the Money Team promotions, Mayweather's rising prospect, Mickey Bay Jr., was on his way to an easy unanimous decision against John Molina. As he was well up on the scorecards, in the 10th and final round, that would all change. In the final minute and 30 seconds of the fight, Mickey was clipped and he was in survival mode. Young and inexperienced, a clutch thing to do in this situation is do Bay did the complete opposite and did his absolute best to not go down, resulting for him to get hit with too many clean blows, forcing the ref to stop the fight. The fight Mamma yeah. Mia! Unbelievable turn of events here in Vegas! 
Jorge Castro was making his third defense of his WBA middleweight title against undefeated John David Jackson. It was entertaining yet dominating performance by Jackson as he was far up on the scorecards. Uh, Castro doesn't have the career of a bottle the way his face looks right now. Castro's in trouble too right now. More and more and more. No, no, no real big punches are getting through clean right now. It's kind of a bitter pattern of playing. Cut on both eyes, tired and hurt. Jackson is moving in to finish the fight, then out of nowhere to be decked by Castro by a perfect left hook. Castro doesn't have the career of a bottle the way his face looks right now. Castro's in trouble too right now. We're, we're closing in on the end. Yeah, if, if he applies himself now, he can stop. Oh! Jackson was unable to recover, and Castro was able to successfully defend his title. Round nine, that is now the question. Three knockdown over the front, and that is it. The third knockdown here in this round. It's all over. What an unbelievable turnaround and comeback for Jorge Castro. Getty's first defense of his IVF super featherweight title against Wilson Rodriguez. Absolutely awful start by Gaddy. Rodriguez was bringing in that heat and Gaddy had no answer as he was starting to swell up bad under his eye. Gaddy's got a huge mouse under his left eye. Hey, I don't know if I've ever seen a fighter swell up so much in those rounds. After a small rally and dodging a head official who was really giving him a tough time to continue in between rounds. Back one. Back, I say back one. Hey, don't push on me, I'm, God damn I'm it. pushing you. Wait. Cover, okay. cover your left eye. Cover your left eye. All right. Cover your left eye or it's over. How many fake? I said cover. Two, How many fake? Now. Oh. It's going to take some drama to rescue Arturo Gotti's star status here. And Gotti finishes the round by pulling it out from nowhere. Normal side. Look at me. Look at me. How many fake? Two. Say it again. Two. Say it again. Come on. All right. Come on. I don't think you can go more than another round, no, Roy. Getty knew what had to be done, and he came back with some heat of his own, dropping Rodriguez with a body shot, then to lay him out to finish the fight. Champion, and I did it. I you blew the tonight again. You sure did. Last and finally, Razor Ruddock versus Raymond Alubo Wale. Ruddock had not stepped in the ring professionally in 10 years. At the age of 51, with guys like Bernard Hopkins fighting at world class levels at 50 years plus, that really does inspire some retired fighters to go out there and achieve a goal of their own. Being that Ruddock in his final fight before retiring, he won the Canadian title. Technically, he's the champion emeritus. So in his first fight, why not fight for the Canadian title? It was not really looking all too well for Ruddock. And in the fourth round, it looked like the fight was about to be over as Raymond was going in for the finish in the fifth. Two quick, three, four, five. Ruddock on the ropes now. Big Ray's got him moving in. Ruddock falls to the floor. He's down on the canvas. But it was at that moment, Raymond forgot who he was fighting. The man he was fighting was Razor, motherfucking Ruddock. Do you know why they call him the Razor? He may have forgotten, and he's about to find out. That uppercut connected, and again, Big Ray stunned. Ruddock's got him in the ropes. Big Ray trying for the clinch. He goes down. Ruddock connected with that uppercut. Down goes Big Ray. And the crowd goes wild here in the Hershey Center. He's hurt. He's hurt. It's over. It's over. Oh boy, to start this list off, Juan Rurango was making his first defense of his IBF junior welterweight title against extremely hard punching Randall Bailey. Both guys are power punchers, so someone's getting knocked out here. Now I knew Rurango had a granite chin, but I didn't know it was that good. Not a soul, and I mean not a soul, would have gotten up 
from a perfectly landed Randall Bailey straight right hand. And Bailey definitely thought that too. It landed perfectly and immediately upon impact, it splits Urango's cheek wide open. Urango took a little breather and got up like it was nothing. Then to continue that round like nothing happened. Added note, I don't have this fight anymore in high definition. It was long loss when my hard drive failed in January 2016. Or it's just lost in my archives because of these uh, funky titles and lack of organization. Either way, I can't find it and you gotta see the rest of the segment in potato. Sorry family. So back on track here. Bailey tries to recreate the success he had dropping him but was unable to hurt Durango again. He got used to his best shot and he was able to bowl right through it, wearing Bailey to the body to where he was able to drop Bailey several times. Is Jackson one of the better trainers in the business? And now down goes Bailey as Urango counters with a left. Can Bailey get up? To ultimately stop him in the 11th round. This was a good series in early 2013. Undefeated Arthur Spilka was against his biggest test, gatekeeper Mike Molo. This was just your classic heavyweight fight. Very crowd friendly, very TV friendly. Despite this being Spilka's first fight in Chicago, Polish fight fans slash football fans came out in full force, easily selling out the arena. Due to an awful cut due to headbutts, Malo was having a lot of trouble getting to Spilka and after what would be the final time the doctor will allow the fight to continue, in round 4 he went for broke. Oh he caught him! There it is! Wow! Just when he needed it badly! The next round Malo was all over Spilka and was unable to get to him punching himself out. In the 6th round, Spilko was able to split right through that guard, knocking him out cold. Oh, he covered up and paid the price! He went down like a red one! He never saw that shot. It's over! This was just one crazy first round here. It really looked like Ramirez was finished, besides having not the best defense. He went down early due to a hit behind the ear, which completely messes up your equilibrium. After being knocked down for the second time, Ramirez was able to survive the first round. After shaking off the cobwebs, Ramirez was able to come back with heat of his own, dropping Dion and folding him up like a beach chair. The first fight, my brother was like, dude doesn't even have a chance, and I was like, bruh, he's gonna win. I was obviously at that time a Thompson fan. Yeah, I'm fans of a lot of random fighters. I really thought the guy was gonna win, and I thought this David Price guy is overrated. That knockout wasn't pretty, but man, I was wilding out in my years of watching boxing. My time watching these two fights here is the most I was straight up just wilding. So since everyone thought it was a fluke and the only way for Price to go back on the road for title contention, a rematch was a must. And early on, Price was getting the best of Thompson, being first and landing, which Tony is a tricky fighter to fight and he doesn't really get the credit he deserved on that. Price towards the end of round two catches Thompson with a perfect shot laying him out. Most guys, they would have been finished, but Thompson, with the mindset that he took bigger and better shots against Vladimir Klitschko, got back up like the two-time contender he is and made it to the third round. Price once again, offensive heavy, laying it out on Thompson, who was for the most part unfazed, but clearly he lost the round. The fourth round, Thompson's legs were fully back, and he is far fresher than Price, who had punched himself out. This is very reminiscent to Latimer Klitschko early in his career before Stewart had revamped his style. Despite it being an even fourth round, Thompson was able to edge Price in that final 10 seconds. Price now showing clear signs of fatigue. The fifth round, Price had completely hit the wall and Thompson was taking full advantage of the situation to where Price was unable to defend himself and was too tired to even respond, which the ref was forced to stop the fight. He's not doing enough with his hands. He's hardly defending himself and the referee steps in and he gets a standing count. He's absolutely knackered and he's counted out. 
Tony Thompson shocks the world again! After failing brutally to win the title against Kiko Martinez, many thought that Hozumi Hasegawa was going to retire. Even the fight was promoted as his last and final fight. Hasegawa decided to not retire and go for one last title run. After pulling off a big win against undefeated Mexican prospect Horoshio Garcia, Hasegawa was in the line to fight for the title one last time. His opponent, WBC Super Bantamweight Champion Hugo Ruiz. Now Ruiz was a scary fighter to face at Super Flyweight to Super Bantamweight. He was incredibly large for the weight class and had a dynamite power. Not a soul gave Hasegawa a chance. The size the size difference was pretty clear between the two. Ozumi was early to the middle of the fight, performing well, but Ruiz was still fresh and was banking on that one shot and in the ninth round Ruiz got him. That pretty much looked like it was it for Hozumi. Hugo was going in for the finish, and then out of absolute nowhere, Hasegawa unloads 15-20 punches while rolling Ruiz's shots, then to completely win the exchange to back him off. This is a Hajime no Ippo green eye moment here. Ozumi saw that this is his last and final chance to win a title and retire into the sunset and literally went for broke. That huge risk paid off as that round ended going to the 10th. Hugo retired from the corner and Hasegawa once again champion in his third weight class. Hasegawa happily retired as champion that following year. While Rigo was literally being squeezed out by the boxing elite to where he couldn't get any fights, he took up to fight 5'11 OPBF featherweight champion Hisashi Amagasa. Promotion wise, Guillermo received more love than ever in his career. He was the main event to Japan's New Year's Eve card, which if you don't know these cards, they are incredibly stacked cards and literally they are the final meaningful boxing matches to end the year off. The fight started off as your typical Rigando fight, but he is putting on an absolute show defensively and on the offense. As much as American TV networks and promoters were coming up with excuses why Rigo is not marketable and boring, he is certainly being the opposite here. <laughs> In the seventh round, by this point in the fight, Rigo is in autopilot mode, but having fun at the same time. While beautifully evading a shot and going around Amagasa, he may have underestimated how fast Amagasa was going to switch, and this is when the fight changes completely. Rigo receives pretty much his second legitimate knockdown of his career. He seemed okay despite Amagasa having full leverage on that shot, but the following shots he will land is what really did the almost fight ending damage. Rigo is saved by the bell in a very animated fashion. And my gosh, in the 8th round, while Rigo is trying to get his legs back, we are actually seeing Rigo go toe-to-toe -to -toe 
and I'm not talking about that BS we saw against Julio Ceja, where he's forced to not fight like himself to make it entertaining. We're seeing an organic toe-to-toe -to -toe battle here. Once Rigo got his legs back, he fought like a pissed off teenager, really just laid out an offensive bombardment on Amagasa to where he broke Amagasa's jaw. Now we had a taste of a rally like this against Donaire, but that was incredibly late in the fight. This was unprecedented. Shoot, if he did that more, he may have gotten more fights after this. Going into the 12th and final round, Amagasa's corner stopped the fight. This fight here is, I like to call, an end of a road type of fight. Whoever wins, the loser, that is their last and final chance at a possible title shot. This fight was for the interim WBO title. And wow, both guys were fighting like it was their last and final title shot. And for Jang Dang, it was 100% confirmed. This is his last and final chance. Back and forth action. Salido draws first blood, scoring the first knockdown. Then after some crazy toe-to-toe -to -toe action in the second round, Jang Dang drops Salido. In the fourth round, Salido knocking down Jang Dang for the second time in the fight towards the end of the round. Salido thinking the fight is over, goes for the finish, and at the beginning, leaves himself wide open then to get knocked down by Jang Dang. Jang Dang did not follow up though because he didn't have the legs and Salido didn't have his legs, so they mutually took the round off and the action erupted in full force in the sixth. Crazy confusion happens at the end of the sixth round. As Salido hurt Jang Dang, he's going in for the finish. The bell rings, none of the fighters heard it, so when the ref broke them up, Salido and his team thought they got the TKO. ¿Qué pasó ahí? ¿Qué pasó? La pelea, o, o, ¿qué fue? Jang Dang put up a good fight, but he was dead tired after being dropped for the third time in the seventh. And at the beginning of the eleventh round, Salido landed a lethal combination, flooring Jang Dang cold to become the interim champion. The fight started off a war of nerves. Not a lot happening, and then at the end of round five, Wilder drew first blood, dropping Ortiz. He's, he's more oh, that's a big shot from Wilder, and down goes Ortiz, here at the end of the fifth, and there's only eight seconds left before the bell. He says, what was that? That was a knockdown, and there is the power. Ortiz fired back, hurting Wilder, to where he was literally saved by the bell. Then to be saved again, by the ringside doctors which gave Wilder an extra 20 to 30 seconds to gather his legs back. Wilder will get his legs back and at the end of the ninth round he was able to come back and wobble Ortiz which could have really ended bad for either guys as Wilder almost ran right into a two-piece combo by Ortiz which luckily he missed. Wilder will go on to dropping Ortiz and finishing him in the 10th round. This was just Hamed's time to shine making his US debut against featherweight great Kevin Kelly. An irritated but warmed up Kelly catches Hamed cold, dropping him in the first round and winning the round big, then again dropping him in the second. Hamed had to do something and do something quick. When he was finally synced in and got a rhythm, he then dropped Kelly. After an exciting third and the fourth round, Hamed drops Kelly and this time it did damage. Hamed trying to go for the finish gets a little too wild and gets grazed causing his glove to touch the canvas due to poor balance and the ref counted as a knockdown not sure if Kelly thought that he hurt him or not but he immediately went on the offensive then to get countered with the fight ending blow Hamed in his American debut put in an absolute show and one for the history books as a Hagler Hearns of the featherweight division what's good kings and queens little intermission here be sure to hit that like button to help the rest of the good old subscribers see this video this video's comment section discussion topic is since Ryan Garcia versus Javante Davis is finally happening, what are your picks and why? Leave in the comments. Thanks for sticking around to the end, and let's get back to the video. Perfect match to be the opener, a battle between undefeateds. The champion, 26-0, 23 knockouts, Mike McCallum, and the challenger, the incredibly hard-hitting, 29-0, 27 knockouts, Julian Jackson. 
This was a junior middleweight version of Hagler vs. Hearns. Soon as the bell rang, Jackson was on McCallum. This fight here, McCallum had to live up to his name, the body snatcher, and really stay committed to the body as Jackson was headhunting beyond belief. Despite getting stunned, McCallum was remaining committed to the game plan of wearing out Jackson to the body because if he doesn't, Jackson may put him away. Some of the best effective body punching I've seen in a championship bout. McCallum was able to counter him so many times to the body within those wild exchanges to where Jackson was completely done for in the second round. McCallum was able to win by TKO in the closing half of the second round. Through the 90s and 2000s, Europe has ruled the super middleweight division. Joe Calzaghe's historic win, cementing that and earning the respect slash notoriety from American boxing media, showing off that America is not the center of every weight class and they do not own every division. Carl Frotch was a rising UK star who picked up Joe Calzaghe's vacant WBC title against undefeated John Pascal in a fight of the year nominee. Taylor who fought in his first fight at super middleweight a month before Frotch's bout for the title. This is pretty bad on Frotch's end, despite being the champion and Taylor's win against Jeff Lacey was a title eliminator for Frotch's title, Ring Magazine had Taylor above Frotch in the rankings. Taylor at number 5, Frotch at number 6. Besides the WBC ordering this fight, the rankings were most likely insulting to Frotch to where he personally challenged Jermaine Taylor and told him not to duck out of this fight. In the typical American counter defense, promoter Lou DiBella stated who the blank is Carl Frotch and what does he mean to American TV. Frotch came back with and says, American TV isn't interested in me, but believe me they are once I knock out Taylor. Frotch was so confident he would do that to where he made his first title defense in America against Taylor. This is on a personal note here. 15 year old me was rooting for Jermaine Taylor that night. I was semi aware of the Pascal fight, but at that time I was siding with DeBella and was like, who is Carl Frotch? If he's so good, why isn't he fighting on American TV? <laughs> Well, I was certainly about to find out in April. The fight couldn't have really started any more worse in Frotch's favor. Taylor completely outboxes and outclasses Frotch early, dropping him in the second round. Frotch is no Kelly Pavlik. He has a really awkward style. After he adjusted, Taylor was having a lot of trouble trying to recreate the same success he had early. Taylor was so far ahead on the scorecards, all he had to do was just stink the fight up. Frotch, who has crazy stamina, was still fresh in the championship rounds. He was landing quite a bit, but it was just off the mark. Round 12, he was finally able to crack Taylor. Taylor is all over the place. Ortega is literally trying to do his best to give him as much chances as possible to finish the fight. Taylor landed a good combination of Frotch, which stopped him momentarily. Really, he should have just stopped right there and put on the Jets, but he overcommitted with more shots. Frotch moves back in, and it was just game over from there as he came back and dropped Taylor. Taylor gets up right at 9 with 29 seconds on the clock. Frotch, who at that time dedicated part of his training camp to moments like that where he needs to finish a guy and had more than enough gas in the tank to let off a final barrage to where the ref was forced to stop the fight with 15 seconds on the clock. And I'm keeping my title. Carl Frotch shocks the boxing world. When a light bulb is about to burn out, it's at its brightest. And in this fight here, this was Price's final hour to get a crack at the heavyweight title. Price was actually shocking many. He started the fight tagging Povetkin and maintaining distance. The third round, Price started well, but he let himself too open and Povetkin dropped him with a perfect combination. But surprisingly, Price's chin held up. I was shocked. He was perfectly fine. The legs were intact. Povetkin saw that, put on the brakes, and didn't fall up, which Price was really starting to open up and land on Povetkin. At the end of the third, he cracked him big time, dropping him. I was like, am I watching David Price? 
That can't be him. He was fighting like the price everyone was expecting to see at the world class level back in 2013. The fourth round, Price showing good defense, covering up and jabbing away at Povetkin with precision. Absolutely amazing effort by Price. Unfortunately, he hit the wall and was just exhausted to where Povetkin easily moved in and exploited his loose defense, dropping him with a combination he did not see. This fight is definitely the 90s version of Wilder vs Ortiz 1. This was Wilder's first real opponent at heavyweight and for Grant this was his first real opponent at heavyweight as well. This fight was an eliminator to fight undisputed champion Lennox Lewis. So Grant seen as the most prominent American contender according to American boxing media to become heavyweight champion and restore order that America rules and always will rule the heavyweight division. million dollar question for Michael Grant tonight is this. Having dominated some of the better B-list heavyweights out there, how will he do against an A-list talent like Galata if Galata doesn't self-destruct? Will he be perceived as another Goliath, perhaps a greater athlete than he is a fighter? Or will he turn out to be that big, big, big man who is the heavyweight of everyone's hopes. This was Grant's first defense of the NABF title, you know, back when that title mattered, in which these type of belts matter in every other country except for America today, which is sad. It's actually a meaningful belt. It signifies you are the best fighter in North America. I don't know whose idea it was to devalue it, but whatever. Galata steamrolls through Grant in the first round, dropping him twice. He barely finishes the round, being saved by the bell in the process. Well, we know Galata has power, and now Grant comes in two. Second knockdown of the round. Cannot be saved by the bell. Grant knocked down twice in the first round, goes to his corner. Galata will win the second. The third round, Grant finally got his legs back and did a thing Galata does not like, a fighter not staying down and standing his ground. In typical Galata fashion, he threw his fundamentals out the window and started fighting dirty, resulting in point deductions. Despite being well ahead in the scorecards, to where in the 10th round, Letterman had it 81-86 Galata, Grant needed a knockout to win. He finally cracks through in the 10th and drops Galata. For Galata, the going is rough, and Galata was like, well, I had a good run, I'm good family. I didn't want the Lewis fight anyway. The wrong answer! Andrew Galata said to him, no! This was Briggs' first defense as a lineal heavyweight champion after defeating George Foreman. Lewis's WBC belt was on the line as well, as he was making his third title defense. Briggs started the fight incredibly fast and hurt Lewis bad. He was all over the place but luckily was able to get a hold of Briggs and make it out of round 1. Briggs in round 2 was all over Lewis, landing beautifully and clearly winning the round. Lewis would finally mount up an offense in round 3 as Briggs was exhausted. After round 3, it was all Lewis, completely picking Briggs apart. Lewis would drop Briggs in the 5th, to where Jim Lampley hilariously ruled out Briggs to not make the count, just to eat his own words as Briggs gets up with little to no effort. Briggs really tried his best, and as he was coming back with a big shot to try and counter Lewis, he slipped, and unfortunately the ref did not see that and stopped the fight right there, not giving Briggs his chance to go out on his shield as the leading champion. I think it was an honest mistake by Frank. If he had a better view of Briggs, he would have allowed it to continue. Douglas was giving Tyson that heat early. The ill-prepared Tyson was not expecting Douglas to come in such peak condition after rounds and rounds of an offensive struggle and now beginning to show fatigue. That's right hand again. This one happened every time. Another right hand and now Tyson seems to be wobbled. He's not throwing back. Buster Douglas is completely dominating this round with jabs. Tyson let out one last ditch effort, a sneaky uppercut that floored Douglas. Most guys would have not gotten up from that, but Douglas was possessed that night and got up barely before the count of 10, then to be saved by the bell. Down goes Douglas. As suddenly as that. Can he beat the count? He got a little overconfident. Got a little loosey-goosey. 
Douglas will come back and knock Tyson out with one of the most beautifulest combinations in heavyweight history to become champion. Rolling willingly just to try to get in the shot that will finish things in oh, What an uppercut by Douglas and down goes Tyson. This was for the Japanese Bantamweight title. Undefeated Toshiaki Nishioka was fighting 16-1 Junichi Watanabe, who awfully looks like your typical late 80s slash 90s Japanese junior high school delinquent that is the leader of a gang. First round starts off very fast, and Watanabe drops Nishioka. Nishioka is like, I can't believe it. I'm the speed king, and I'm out here getting dropped by this blonde haired Kuwabara looking dude. A young fighter's mistake there, because he was expecting the ref to say break, which he did with the previous initiated hold, but protect yourself at all times, my guy. He didn't take any more chances with this guy and started fighting with his free hand in between holds. And in round two, he finally cracked him, equaling the knockdown count. A young Nishioka, that dude was savage. He was finishing this guy off with a smile on his face. He really must have not liked that guy. Oh man, so where do I start here? Mayweather gets rocked by Mosley with a nice right. There's a hard right hand. And that may be the hardest punch that Floyd Mayweather has taken in recent years. Okay, no biggie. Floyd seems okay. Then Mosley was able to land a huge shot. And for the first time, this is probably the most hurt I've seen Floyd. My top five greatest chins of all time. That should have dropped him right there. So people were wilding out when this happened. So let's take a look who was cheering on Mosley in the front row. To point out the obvious, Oscar is wilding out, cheering on his best friend right in Richard Schaefer's face as he is looking incredibly worried. Steven Espinoza is wilding out. Lani Ali, Muhammad Ali's wife, was cheering on Sugar, as well as Michael J. Fox and Busta Rhymes. The only noticeable faces I saw genuinely worried was Mariah Carey, Nick Cannon, Jamie Foxx, and surprisingly, Mark Wahlberg, who is a big Pacquiao fan. So back on track here, Floyd got his legs back and made some amazing adjustments to where he completely shut down Mosley's offense. I'm talking about 2009-2010 New York Jets defense, Revis Island. Ain't nothing getting past this man. Floyd dominated the fight from round three and on to get the unanimous decision. Andy Lee is one of the clutchest boxers of the past 20. It was going to end. Lee lands the punch everyone happens to sleep on, which is the right hook, and puts away Jackson right then and there. In my previous installment of the series, I had Andy Lee's fight with Jackson. This was literally Lee's next fight. So there was some alleged drama coming into this fight. Rapper Jay-Z attempted to dip into the boxing industry with his sports promotional banner, Rock Nation Sports, and started off with minor success signing up fighters. Korobov, who was a highly regarded contender, was one of them. He was a mandatory opponent of Peter Quillen's WBO title. As ambitious as the new promotion was, an insane amount of money was thrown out during the purse bid. Rock Nation won the purse bid by a landslide of $1.9 million to $1.2 million. Quillen was set to make an all-time high of his entire career. So this is where the alleged drama took place. This is a rumor, tall tale, not fact. Al Heyman supposedly had beef with Beyonce at that time. Jay-Z by association. Heyman pieced together a great plan, the fight was off, Quillen vacated the title, Andy Lee was promoted, and now it's a fight for the WBO middleweight title between Korobov and Lee. With all that being said, let's get started with Andy Lee. 
Emmanuel Stewart saw Lee's talent early and said one day he will become the world champion. This was Lee's last crack at the title and he made it known that he will fulfill Emmanuel Stewart's prophecy and win this fight to become world champion. Everything's come together at the right time and now it's time for me to fulfill that dream and make true the words Emmanuel said when he said I'd be world champion. The fight started off rather even. Lee did have his moments, but Korobov seemed to be ahead. In the sixth round, Korobov catches Lee with a perfect shot, and briefly, it looked like he got Lee good. Till before you know it, Lee had landed his signature right. The same right that bailed him out of his last fight. This is just destiny here. Korobov is out on his feet, almost completely defenseless. Bayless trying to give him a chance, and was later forced to step in and stop the fight. Lee is finally a world champion. This title is for him, but it's also for the man who made me, Emmanuel Stewart. We spent, I lived with him for, for nearly seven, eight years. He, he said I would win a world title. His wife Marie came here today to watch me fight, flew all the way from Detroit. And I love all the Rich Stewart family, Sugar Hill and Diane, and everybody in Detroit. And Kronk, thank you very much. So Dylan White became the mandatory opponent for the WBC title long, long ago. He won the WBC interim title, pretty much further signaling he is the mandatory. Now coming into 2020, he really could have just sat on rank and not fought or fought a guy within the top 100. But he decided to risk all that waiting on a side quest against a hungry Alexander Povetkin, which this is more than likely his last run at the title. Ironically enough, I made a meme of White's situation using one of Loiter Squad's skits, and little I would know, this would actually come to life. And don't ever come back! Oh, shit. The fight started off a bit of a feeling out, but White having the clear edge over the H warrior Povetkin. In the fourth round, White would drop Povetkin not once, but twice. Luckily, the second knockdown was at the end of the round, and Povetkin was saved by the bell. Povetkin in the fifth, showing signs of wear, knows that if he doesn't do something this round and get this man out, his run at the title is over. And in the first 30 seconds of the fifth, the first effective shot Povetkin threw the whole fight would completely end white. But that is one of the oh, most shocking wow. turnarounds I've ever oh, seen in a fight, Unbelievable! What a left uppercut! This was the ninth title defense by Terry Norris. Waters was ranked number five by the WBC. He was a heavy underdog, virtually unknown, as this was his first fight in America. This fight started off as your usual prime Terry Norris fight, dropping Waters in the first and just working him the whole round. Round two was looking just like that. Norris was landing beautifully, and at that pace, it looked like this or the next round he was going to finish him off till Waters landed a crystal clear combo in Norris. From the looks of it, that body shot combination really bothered Norris to where he let his guard down and Waters was able to follow through and drop him. Norris now pretty angry, I mean, just look at him. Instead of going on the defensive, he is immediately on Waters, turning this fight into a brawl. Both guys having their moments and shining, Norris was able to get the best out of those exchanges to end the round off. This round being named 1993, Ring Magazine Round of the Year. Norris continued to bulldoze through till he finally cracked Waters in the second half of the third round. Surprisingly, the fight was not stopped and Waters barely made it out the round. The corner stopped the fight before the fourth round started. Norris is still angry to where the ref and the trainer had to calm him down. If anyone can tell me the backstory on this, please comment. The first fight was amazing, the rematch was equally amazing. Back and forth action, Quadras drop Estrada early in the third. Estrada was able to tie the knockdown count, dropping Quadras in the 11th round. Quadras putting up a valiant effort, couldn't get Estrada off him. After the second knockdown and more punishment, he was later stopped in the final minute of the 11th. I like to put out there, Estrada fights this weekend in a unification match against Roman Gonzalez. This fight is a guaranteed war. Both guys have slowed down just a bit, where I am almost certain both are going to be trading knockdowns. This rematch has been almost nine years in the making, and I can't wait for this Saturday. 
So originally there were talks of number two ranked WBC champion Takashi Mura unifying against number one ranked WBA champion Takashi Uchiyama in a highly anticipated rematch for the ring title. That fight did not fall through and the WBC ordered that Mura face mandatory challenger undefeated Francisco Vargas. Now your boy was working that fight week and the fight. My first boxing event I stepped foot in. Young intern honcho. Yep, that's me right there. I have no designated seat so when working I have to move all over the arena to get my shots which made my job quite difficult as I was given the wrong credential at that time. So I literally had to ninja my way all over the place. Anyways, Vargas caught Mira cold, almost dropping him in the first. Mira would bounce back slowly, pecking and pecking away, but not winning the rounds as Vargas was up on Harold's card 3 to zip. Mira would drop Vargas in the second half of the fourth round. Vargas would put up a great effort going toe to toe with Mira, but Mira was winning the exchanges and looking like the fresher fighter. Mira would hurt Vargas towards the end of the 8th round, trying to finish him off but was saved by the bell. Coming into the ninth round, no one saw this coming. Vargas started the round off with an anomaly of sharp shots to drop Mira. That venue was so quiet during the fight and it wasn't at max capacity. The whole venue was literally shaking from the crowd while and out. I was like, where did all these people come from? Mira is out on his feet. Vargas is going for broke. Not the wisest of decisions, but Mira attempted to go on the offensive rather than try to hold Vargas, resulting in Vargas to just pummel him more to where Tony Weeks was forced to stop the fight. This was Garcia's biggest test, make or break fight, and holy crap, this was not starting well. Ryan was having his moments offensively, not really landing effectively, but you can see Luke was setting up trap cards on him. And within due time, Luke flattened Garcia. Most folks would have not gotten up from that, but he did and he was able to pull through and regroup for the next round. Ryan immediately knew what he did wrong and agreed with Eddie since they were working on this in training camp to fix these bad habits and he was easily able to make those adjustments. Which I would like to compare to a fight that was literally just days before with Kosei Tanaka and Kazuto Oyoka. Tanaka came into the fight with bad habits, never ended up fixing in camp, and Ioka completely exploited that to where each knockdown was caused by those bad habits. So Garcia was easily able to correct his defensive flaw to where Luke could not recreate the same thing he did before. To where Garcia was able to have success, hurt him in the fifth bad, then to finish him off with a picture perfect body shot in the seventh round. This looked like it was going to be an early night for Evander. He drops Cooper with a beautiful combination to the body in the first round and just outworks him for the rest of the round. In the third, Cooper timed it perfectly and set Evander up with a counter to where Evander is out on his feet. Since the ropes held him up, he was given a standing aid count. I don't know how he was able to weather the storm. Then that same round come out of nowhere with everything but the kitchen sink at Cooper for an entire minute to end off round three. The fight would calm down after that and become more technical. Holyfield would outbox and hustle Cooper to where he was able to put him away in the seventh round. Whoa. He's taking some shots from the champion now. He's getting ripped. He is getting ripped. Uppercuts. Oops. Holyfield turning it on. I don't know how Cooper is standing. I don't know how he can take this beating. Look at these uppercuts. One of the greatest heavyweight fights of all time between two legends. This was Walcott's second defense of the heavyweight title. In the first round, Walcott will become the first fighter to drop the 42-0 Rocky Marciano. Very competitive fight, but Walcott had the edge on Rocky, and he was up on all judges' scorecards. The 13th round, Rocky stalking, stalking, trying to find the right moment, and there it was. 
for both guys really. Rocky threw his hardest shot, Walcott the same, but Rocky threw his just a smidge of a second sooner than Walcott, resulting in Rocky to hit Joe first. To end the fight right then and there to become the heavyweight champion of the world. There was a lot riding on this fight. Pretty much Rocky's entire community bet their life savings and whatever they had that he would win this fight. And as a big thank you, they threw him a parade as thousands of spectators gathered to watch that stretched all over town. This fight was definitely something out of a video game. I honestly don't know how Moore made it out of the round, but it happened. Moore was knocked down not once, not twice, but four times in the fight. The fourth time being counted as a slip. Archie barely made it out of the first round. Ten seconds, Archie Moore is going to make it. There's the bell. Moore would slowly but surely come back in the fight and drop Darrell four times to stop him in the 11th round to retain the light heavyweight title. Moore back at the again. And now he goes again in the right hand. Three, struggling at nine, ten, he is out. Man, oh man, what a dramatic turn in this fight. Moore in the post-fight interview discussed that he didn't really remember much of the first round besides the knockdowns. He stated that the fourth round was a turning point of the fight in his favor. He, uh, when you came into that ring in that beautiful sequin robe, I thought to myself, he looks like Superman. Well, after seeing you fight here to- For more installments, be sure to like, share, and if you're new, subscribe. Subscribe to Patreon for Patreon-backed projects and early access. I'm Alphys Hancho. And I'm out. I started beginning to come my way in, and about the fourth round, when I began to stiffen him up with, with good level straight jabs uh -huh. and, and work him around. And then I knew that I could get a right hand punch over, which I did. And on top of that, this is part four to yeet or get yeeted. For more installments, be sure to like, share, and if you need to subscribe, subscribe to Patreon for Patreon backed projects and early access. I'm Alphys Hancho, and I'm out.